I want to start at the verse that kind of kicked this off in my heart. It's from Solomon's writings in the book of Proverbs. Chapter 16, verse 25. I'm going to read from the New King James. This is not the token appearance of this phrase in Proverbs. In fact, it appears a couple of chapters before this. So it was a theme, in other words. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way of death. Now I want you to notice the wording is very particular. There is a way, a path, a decision that you can make that seems like the right decision, but the end of that decision is not death. This is how this gets quoted a lot of times. The end of the decision is not that you die. How many of you know you're going to physically die anyway? The end of your decision is not death. It's the way of death. Now, what's the difference? We make a decision in our spirit, man. It seems right to us, like the right thing to do. Yet, it puts us on the way of death. It puts us in a place where we begin... Now, this is my own interpretation, okay? This is actually how I wrote it down in my own notes for myself. There is a way that we choose that seems like the right choice, but when we're done, we smell like death. It's not that we're dead, but we're hanging around the ways of death for so long. And when you hang around in the ways of death, you begin to exude some of the patterns of death. You've been stolen from, killed, and destroyed. Jesus said on the counter of that, I've come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. The enemy, the thief, which is all of those who want to give you another way but Jesus, will, they're thieves and robbers. They still kill, destroy, but I want you to live an abundant life. So Jesus wasn't saying you're necessarily going to fall over dead because of the thief, but you're going to live a lifestyle where you smell like death. You don't have joy. You don't rest in peace. And the way that you got there will seem like the right way to you. Now, this is not, I could have made a decision at work to do this, but I made a decision at work to do this. That's how this message always gets preached. You're going to be faced with two choices this week. You can make the right one and you can make the wrong one. Listen to the Holy Ghost. He'll tell you the right one. And then we get so bizarre with this, we can't figure out if we should eat at McDonald's or Hardee's because the Holy Ghost hasn't told us which one and we're afraid one of them's got poison food this morning and we get all paralyzed. Red shirt, blue shirt. I'm not really sure. Lord, tell me, red shirt or blue shirt? And the Lord just says, just put one on. In fact, take them both if you want to. You're going to sweat a lot. Change at lunch. I don't care. That's not what this text is about. The way that we're talking about is the actual theme of the Bible. That way back in the Garden of Eden, man made a choice of what way he was going to govern himself. It seemed like the right choice. Well, we have a little bit of experience now to find it might not have been so good. Now, I want to work my way into that Garden of Eden. That's the Garden of Paradise in the Hebrew. And I want to do that by going a little bit of a route to get there. I want to take you to the book of Revelation, the second chapter. Now, the book of Revelation is not a book that is about scary events in your future of which CNN and Fox News have the heads up on. If that's the way that you view the book of Revelation, I would tend to believe that this book scares you to death and that you haven't wanted much to do with it in your Christian walk. And I would say that you've been so deceived by the enemy as to walk away from the greatest picture of Jesus that the Bible has. The greatest picture of Jesus is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for none of them open with, this is a revelation of Jesus. The word revelation is also, in the Greek, is the word apocalypto. We are so influenced in our American Western culture that we take the word apocalypto, we turn it into the English word apocalypse, and if I say I'm going to preach to you the apocalypse today, everybody freak out and go, oh my goodness, this is the end of the world message. But that's not what apocalypse means. Apocalypse is an unveiling. It's to take the curtain off and show you what you didn't see before. We, because of our Hollywood mentality, turned the word apocalypse into, we're going to take the veil off of how this is all going to end, and we're going to show you the White House burning down, and we're going to show you Congress failing, and we're going to show you America falling into the sea, and we're going to show you uh, wars and earthquakes and rumors of wars, and then we began to take apocalypse and turn it into a negative thing. But I'm here to tell you that the apocalypto of Jesus Christ is the unveiling of Jesus under a new covenant. It's to allow you to get a glimpse of Jesus that you couldn't see under Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm going to get a little too, a little too theological for some on a Sunday morning, but if you can run with me today, I think we'll learn something together. 
Did you know that when you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 90% of those books, you are not seeing Jesus unveiled under the new covenant. You are seeing Jesus under an old covenant trying to change your perception of his daddy. Trying to introduce you to the first steps of relationship out of religion. Most of those gospels are written to the Jews who have come out of religion and Jesus is trying to transition them into a relationship with God. That's why he says, let not your heart be troubled. You've believed in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house. He's really trying to take you from God to Father. I'm still trying to do that in the church and so are most, most of us preachers trying to take you from God to the Father. But when you get to the book of Revelation... You're seeing Jesus in all of His glory. This is why His eyes are flames of fire and His voice is like many waters. And it, all the stuff that happens in that first chapter of Revelation is not to freak you out. It's to show you you serve a big God who wins, who is a victor, who is everything that you came into relationship to meet. It's Jesus. It's full of Hebrew imagery because He was writing to a Jewish audience who was facing the end of their age. And it's full of that kind of imagery. And I don't want to get too much into the eschatology of it today. But one of the things that we forget about the book of Revelation is that it was written to seven churches that existed in that day about events that were going to happen in their lifetime. And they were on a circuitous postal route on the western side of the Roman Empire. If you start out going north and work your way in a circle, you will come to every one of the seven churches of Asia in order. And when the writer wrote the book of Revelation and seven copies of it, he intended for it to go along that Roman postal route to the seven churches in which it was designed. The first of those churches is our subject today. And I'm not doing a series on the seven churches of Asia, but I want to show you something today that if it was an issue in Ephesus, and by the way, pause, time out, I don't believe, like I used to believe a decade ago, that the seven churches of Asia are a representation of seven church ages. I believe they were seven actual churches that had seven issues, and some of them had more than seven, and that God wrote to them about the incidents in their lifetime. However, just like you can read Paul's letter to the church at Philippi and learn something, you can read the revelation to the church at Ephesus and learn something, and that's what we're going to do today. Because the church at Ephesus had a problem that reminds me very much of the American church.